Our scripture comes out of 1 John chapter 2 this morning. It is a long one, but I, I just couldn't pick what to take out of it. So we're going to read it all anyway. So 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 to 17. My dear children, I write to, this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. The old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. It is the truth. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing, and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the, dark, in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I am writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word, Lord. How it lives, how it breathes, Lord, how it affects each of us, how you speak to each one of our hearts, Lord. We thank you for that this morning, Lord. I pray your blessing on the message. This morning, help me to speak your words, Lord, not, not just mine. I thank you for this, Lord. Help me to speak clearly. Holy Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the first few verses I read this morning, I think say a lot. They state the mo motivation of just about any pastor this, that's speaking anywhere this morning. Hopefully on any, any given Sunday morning service. My motivation this morning is the same as what, as what the authors here is. I know that many of you here have put your faith in Jesus Christ. As I have. Does that mean that, that any of us are perfect? No. It doesn't. And, and <laughs> I can guarantee you it doesn't. But the Lord knows that. And that's why the scripture said what it did. Look at the middle of verse 1 and verse 2 from this morning. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Thank God we do have the advocate. I know I need him daily, as I'm sure each of us do. I have to tell you, this message was a struggle for me. I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks, and I'll tell you, this week my ADD was, was really kicking in. I had a, an awful time with this. And I think, I think the, a lot of that, the reason is, because it convicts me. And, that, and that's the case on a lot of Sundays, a lot of weeks when I'm putting together a message. It speaks to me as much as it does, I hope, to, to each of you. Haley and I had some interesting discussions on this message. She had knocked me off the ledge a couple of times. But that's not bad. That's good. Because we're all in the same boat. As believers, we're all growing. We're all growing spiritually. We're all working on becoming closer with our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. As a church, we're growing. I think, and I'm... We get caught up in numbers. I don't think it's, it's a numbers thing. We're growing spiritually. I hope you all agree. We, it's a continual process. And, and I thank God that we get to do it together. We get 
to grow together. So let's continue on today learning and growing together as we study God's living word. I want to get, keep going in verses 3 to 5 from this morning. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep, does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. This is how we know we are in him. We keep his commands. We try. Again, none of us are perfect. What do you think of when, when you think of commands? You think of keeping his commands? Well, we think of the big ten, you know, the, the ten commandments, the big ones. We, 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 we get them stuck in our head. Think of, well, no gods before me, no false gods. Honor your mother and father. Don't murder. Don't, don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet other people's stuff. You know, the big ones. These are the commands most of us think of when we think of we'll keep his commands. Well, Jesus covered all of them in Matthew 22, 34 to 30. And it's a lot shorter. In this account, hearing that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him in this. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And then two of them. That's better. That sounds great. But, but think about it this way. If we are doing those two commands, if we are putting our love for God first, our love for each other first, the rest of them are going to be fulfilled. That's going to take care of the other two because if we're living with the love of Jesus in our hearts, if we're living with the love for God, we don't have room for all that other stuff. We don't have room to covet other people's stuff. We don't have room for hatred, for, for chasing after things we don't need, for things the world would tell us. We don't have room for all that if we're filled with love, if we're filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't share room with all that other stuff. So who's this message for today? Just as he mentions in the scriptures, it's for all of us. He listed children, fathers, young men. I'm adding ladies to that. It doesn't mention it, but I have no doubt he meant it for them as well, for all of you. How does it relate to Camel Sunday? Oh, I'm getting to that. And the stuff up here, it's all part of it today. So let's read a couple verses from this morning. I'm not living in the world. Verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and his desires pass away. But whoever does, the will of God lives forever. And we're getting a little bit closer to what's on the table. I'm going to get to it. Let's look up one more thing. <coughs> smaller command slash direction from scripture. You see, living in, as Christ did, bringing ourselves in close relationship has as much to do with the little commands as it does those big ones. The little directions we see in scripture that tell us how to live, that tell us how to go about our daily lives and try to live as Jesus did. And we miss them. We miss the little ones. What's that saying? You, couldn't, you can't see the forest through the trees. Sometimes we get so focused on the big thing that we, we forget to, we, don't, we miss the rest of it. So let's get serious about the little things. And that'll make the big one seem so much better. <clears throat> one of the seemingly little command, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do not exasperate your children. And it says fathers. That goes for, again, it goes for mothers, fathers, all of us. You could say, don't exasperate your spouse. We, we tend to do that once in a while. I know I do. Now, I looked up, exasperate, it's a big word. I looked it up. What does exasperate mean? Well, the, the, the dictionary says to irritate intensely and infuriate. Now, I also, this made me laugh, because I, I thought of it as, as, a, as being a teen once and not having young children. The synonyms, I laughed out loud when I read this infuriate, incense, annoy, irritate, madden, enrage, antagonize. Provoke, irk, vex, 
get on someone's nerve, ruffle someone's feathers, rub the wrong way. I laughed out loud again when I read this. And I remember as a teenager, you know, your hormones were all screwed up. You're trying to figure out life. You're trying to watch parents who don't have it all together, and, and you're supposed to figure all that out. So I just thought that exasperate and the definition were great. I laughed, and yet I thought, that's not funny. <coughs> At least, it's not as far as it depends on us. Can, what can we as parents do to lessen the exasperating experience for our child, for our children, regardless of, of what age they are at? They're trying to grow up following Jesus. And like I said, they're watching us, and we don't have it all figured out yet. And yet, we're trying to teach them how to do it. Well, that again, that brings me to the things on the table here in front of me. These, these things on the table, they're, they're things of the world, good or bad. The world gives you these things in an attempt to distract you, attempt to distract you from the ways of God, the, the culture of God, His Word, the ways of salvation, what, what Christ told His disciples, go into the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They don't want us to think about that. They want us to think about the things of the world. So are they good or bad? They can be one of two things. They can be a distraction, or they can be an opportunity. They can go either way. We have two things we can do with all the things of the world, all the talents that we have been given. Now, how can they be distraction? How can they? How can these things exasperate our children? Think about. I love to hunt. I have hunted since I was old enough to shoot squirrels, much like I'm sure Gavin and any of his brothers and sisters have hunted. I love to hunt. My first, what, my brothers and I, we started hunting, and we shot rifles. We shot 22s. From the time we were old enough to do it in the backyard, we'd go through hundreds and hundreds of rounds of ammo in an afternoon just shooting tin cans. We, we, we shot on 4-H riflery teams in, in Penn State. Um, hunting is a tradition in our family. It's, it's some of the earliest memories I have. I have my grandfather's, uh, two sets of his horns actually from my great grandfather that he shot. I have his gun cabinet and my gun sitting and he made and his guns were in. My first memory, I have my mother's shotgun that she had. My first, one of my earliest memories of anything to do with deer is finding a deer soaking in the bathtub. That was kind of disgusting, but it's a memory. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else's parents did that. That was weird. But it's a memory. Now, think about this. You're talking about exasperating children. Is it an experience? Is it an opportunity? If that's all the hunting is, if all the hunting is, is heritage, if it's a tradition, then it's a distraction. But we can use it as an opportunity. If all my son thinks, if I leave my son to think that we just do it because we've always done it and it's all about the horns on that buck over there, then it's a distraction. If I'm not teaching him to love nature and to be as appreciative for the fawn as he is for that buck and the meat that will provide the horns you put on the table, then it's a distraction. I want him to appreciate that fawn. I want him to appreciate the beauty of God's creation as much as he does anything else. And to realize where it all comes from. If, it, if it's just about the horns, the horns are cool. I'd love that one. It looks like that hanging on my wall. I don't yet, and that's okay. And I'd love to, but there's more to it than that. So that, that helps us make the distinction whether it's a distraction or whether it's an opportunity. I have the choice to make it either one. Now, all these things could be distractions. They could be all, like, money. We can chase money. I, I, but the intent with any of these things, it's the intent, and that's what matters. How they're obtained. How these things are gotten. What, do, are they, were they distractions for us? Or do we use them as opportunities? Think about the talents that each of you have. Gavin loves to hunt. That's a passion of his. He's also a talented writer. We get articles in the paper, and they're good. What an opportunity to reach people, to, to plant seeds like he just, like he talked about earlier. It's the intent with which we do it. That gives him a platform to reach people. Think of any of you that are teachers, the amount of, of people you reach, the amount of children you reach. 
every day. You get that opportunity. That's more opportunity than most of us are going to get to reach children, to shape minds, to shape hearts. I think of Sherry and Susan, the, the photography. Another platform. You get to show people the beauty of God's creation. What, what he's designed, what is, what's out there in nature that most of us don't get to see. The little things, the, the beautiful sunset you see. People post pictures of once in a while. That's beauty of God's creation. We can share that. We can illustrate that, but that has to be the intent of it. If we're just doing it, all these things for that, then it's a distraction. But it can be an opportunity. I think of coaching. Many of you have, have coached. As your kids have grown up, many of you are, I know I'm still coaching. It's an opportunity. It can be a distraction. Think of sports, what you see on television. It could be what you see on television is not what sports should be. What they're showing you is the people that have, have got caught up in the money, in the trophies, in all of that stuff. They don't, of course they don't show you. There's good guys too. They don't show you the ones praying before the games and, and the good things that some of them do. You don't get to see them. But it's a huge distraction. It can be. So we as, as coaches have the opportunity to affect not, our, not just our children, but the whole team. We can teach them to have an attitude of sportsmanship, a godly attitude. We can teach them to carry themselves the way they should, to be different than the rest of them. We can teach that. That's an opportunity we have. It doesn't have to be a distraction. That's a beautiful opportunity. Whether it's on the soccer field, whether it's on the, on the baseball field. Jake's not here this morning, but I remember talking to him about starting his academy. And he said, I want to shape young men. I don't want to just teach them to play soccer. I want to teach them to be better young men, to grow up and be somebody because they're not going to be a soccer player for the rest of their life. Maybe one of them will, but it, it, it's, it's unlikely. So we need to teach them the, the God-given basics that are going to get them through the rest of their life. It's an opportunity rather than a distraction. So that's what we can do this morning. All these things could be a distraction depending on how we got it. But it, it doesn't have to be. It can be a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Just as we said in hunting, it's about learning to appreciate the littlest things. Without, it's, it's nice to get the big things, the, the big, beautiful horns over there. We, like I said, we'd all love to have them on the wall. But it's about appreciating that as much as, as that. That's taking, all the, that's taking your time and making it an opportunity. Rather than a distraction. Don't let it distract us. We all do that. I teach Noah. We, we're trying to trap. This is the thing we, we caught last year. That's his, his coon from last year. It's the first thing he ever trapped. But we, we take that time when we're in the woods. We take that time to think about what God has done. What he has given us. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to be out there. To see those things. We talked about yesterday where we were in the woods getting our tree stands, our, our blinds ready and all that stuff. We think about God's creation. I said, think about what it was like before the fall of man. Before, we didn't have to trap and hunt. We had to worry about, they didn't have to worry about a bear eating them. It, it wasn't the same. We can take those times to interject conversation like that. and preach scripture at them. We just discussed it. It was pretty cool. It, it's time we can take to talk about that stuff. It's an opportunity. We are faced with opportunities every day. Every one of you is. I don't care what job you do or where you're at. It's an opportunity. It's hard-pressed for any of you to find a day when you don't interact with another person. And if you do, that's an opportunity. No matter what you do. I know we have a couple police officers that attend here. You interact with people. We have people that work at vet offices, at doctor's offices. You interact with people. That's the way it is. Some of you are students. You're filled with opportunities. You guys get to, I wouldn't want some of your opportunities that you guys have. But you get them. You have them regardless. You have an opportunity to be different. To give, to, to, to act different, to act as God would have you act. Not as the world would have you act. The world wants you to be distracted. They want you to think about the money and the trophies and the sports and all that stuff. And that's where it is. It's just stuff. But the experience behind the stuff can be a wonderful wonderful opportunity. It's, it's fun. It, it makes your life so much better when you take the time to use the opportunity. 
It's the same for any of these items up here. How we got them. When it comes to sports, there's a, I'm as bad as Gavin, yeah, I got my stuff all messed up. There's a sports writer. And the quote came to mind, I had no idea who wrote it, so I looked it up. But the man named Grantman Rice had a quote. It says, for when the one great scorer comes to write our name, write, to write against your name, he marks not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. That was, I don't know why it popped into my head, but it did. Again, it's not about, it's not about winning or losing. It's not about shooting a trophy or a spike that's running through the woods. What about the experience? What did you get to talk about with your son or with your hunting buddy when you're in that blind? Did you use it as an opportunity? Or was it as a distraction? So I want to encourage you today to go out tomorrow. Hunt. Fill your dice. I hope you get something worth hanging on the wall. I hope somebody in here does. I feel like to see it. But will it be a distraction or will it be an opportunity? Make it an opportunity. We all have a chance to have that opportunity every day. Use it. Don't be a distraction. Be that opportunity that somebody needs. Say, hey, I want to know more about, about what you believe. I want to know more about this God that you believe in. That makes you, where does that joy come from? What makes you so happy? What makes you act different than everybody else? What makes you not take part in the crude jokes at work? What makes you just a little bit different? Use the opportunity. It's there. Let us pray today. Heavenly Father, we thank you this afternoon, Lord. We just praise you for your word. Lord, for the beauty of your creation, Lord, that so many of us are going to get to experience tomorrow, Lord. Father, whether, it's, whether we get anything or not, Lord, it's just it's a joy and a pleasure to be out in your creation. Lord, help us to remember that, to give thanks for it. I thank you for it. I thank you for how, how it speaks to us, how it, when we study it, when we look at nature, Lord, it, it screams that there is a creator. And, and we know that's part of your design, Lord, we thank you for it. Help us, Lord, to use it as an opportunity. I thank you for it, Lord. Father, we do ask your protection for those going out tomorrow, Lord. It, is, it, it can be a dangerous time, Lord, but we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for your bounty in advance, Lord. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.